Hey everybody, I'm Gabe. And I'm Roman. And this week we're reviewing Killers of the Flower Moon, coming up next on Review Crew. Alright, Roman, let's start with the biggest complaint levied against this movie. You and I saw it together. Three hours, 26 minutes. At no point in that runtime did you snuggle me, and I was a little sad, but that's not my biggest issue with this movie. A lot of people are upset about that length. How do you feel about it? I mean, look, yeah, I don't mind them long, you know me, but, like, it, it, this movie I do think is too long. Like, but I don't think it's, like, so obnoxiously overdone and, like, nothing was cut out and there was no attempt to, like, condense the narrative. It's long on purpose. I still think it is too long. I still think there's probably a half hour that could have been bled from this movie and kept a lot of the effect. But this is this is a Scorsese movie at its most like archetypical or archetypal, sorry, condensed, whatever you want to call it. Like all of his normal tricks of the trade are are at work here. And it's a classic Scorsese story of a guy who starts out kind of unassuming, becomes something unrecognizable from himself and more corrupted at the end. So you need that long runtime to really sell that whole uh, that whole feeling of transformation. But there are parts of this movie where I was like, I kind of get the point. Yeah. So you and I saw it on a Thursday. Saturday, I went back and saw it again. Um, and that was because after, on Thursday, I you saw it man. just, I just saw it, you know, pure. I read no critics' impressions of it. Saturday, once critics started releasing their statements yeah. and a lot of the stuff that I had previously like believed about the movie, they also thought, so I felt validated with that. <laughs> Going back with those goggles on, I, I what I've realized about the runtime is I think it's intentionally supposed to be brutal. Like, this is a movie where Scorsese is just beating you over the head with these atrocities, with this complicit white injustice. I want to take a second to say that I am proudly indigenous, and so this movie has a different context for me than it has for many people. Um, but I think that length only served to, as you said, develop these themes more. Ernest Burkhart starts as an idiot, plain and simple, and at the end, he is a homicidal maniac who would kill the person he loved most for money. Yeah. And I think that was just incredible. Now, that performance, Ernest Burkhart, like we said, did a, you know, it was played by DiCaprio in a performance that I leaned over to and said, there's, a, there's an Oscar reel moment in here. Yeah. What did you think about his performance? Well, we can start with him. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great actors here. Obviously, we'll get to that. Look, it's like, it's Leonardo DiCaprio doing Leonardo DiCaprio things. Um, and that's, you know, it's not a complaint at all that I have with this movie or even with his performance. It, it, in fact, it's praise. Like, it's amazing. It's just, I think there's going to be a group of people who are like, walk into this, walk out of it, and say, I've seen this before. It reminds me too much of Goodfellas, too much of Wolf of Wall Street. But I'll never get tired of that. Like, yeah, DiCaprio's hitting all of his normal beats of his explosive anger, his, you know, uh, the, the, the emotional swings, and he's so, so good at that. But most of the characters, most of the, the more well-known actors in here, they're doing a role that we've seen them do, and we've seen them do in Scorsese movies. Now, there's a lot of originality in, in, uh, in, in this film, too, but I, I do kind of want to address that complaint because... There are people who I've talked to, people who have seen it, who are like, you know, I like it, but I don't like it as much as Wolf of Wall Street. It's always kind of put in this context of, like, Scorsese movies. But on kind of the positive side, of it, if you haven't seen a lot of Scorsese movies, this is a pretty good one to start with, and you get to see it in theaters. Absolutely. Yeah, DiCaprio, as we were talking about, I think he does a phenomenal job. Uh, he, he uses some, like, really cool tools to get into his character. He does some pretty serious prosthetics. He has a yeah. horrible haircut. Uh, but, like, it's, it seems to help him become someone you wouldn't pay attention to, which, you know, they spend a lot of time in this movie saying he's, like, super handsome and he has, like, really piercing blue eyes. But, like, by modern standards, this is, like, the ugliest DiCaprio has ever been in a movie. Well, yeah. And it's, it, it really helps you be like, oh, he's I still can Leo, though. Exactly. <laughs> you, you, can, you can see why people wouldn't pay attention to him. I think Leo playing Rick Dalton before this, there were certain scenes where you could really see, like, the lessons he learned from playing that character transitioning over to Ernest Burkhart, and I thought that was fantastic. Another person I thought was fantastic is Robert De Niro, who I sincerely hope gets at least a Best Supporting Actor nomination. I don't know if he's better than Robert Downey Jr. Um, there's a scene in this movie 
where DiCaprio tells his uncle, who's played by De Niro, that he and his wife are expecting again. And for a split second, De Niro's character lets down this this facade of being like, oh, I'm so happy for you guys. And you can see the menace and hatred. Yeah. And you can tell he is planning something. This child will die. I fully agree that that is, I think, the best acted moment in this this whole movie. I don't. Do we want to give a minor spoiler about an actor who is uh, who comes in near the end of this movie? Oh, she, we'll touch on that ending cameo at the end. No, 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 no. Not the, not the the very end end. The. I think you can hit us with it. Tell, tell yeah, us. Brendan Fraser makes an appearance oh, yeah. in this movie, yeah. and, uh, and and when he does, the you know at least our theater went went kind of nuts. At um, least you and I. Went nuts. Yeah, I did. Well, it wasn't just us. I think there's a, a handful of people there on the uh, on the Brendan Fraser hype train. I'll uh, I'll, I'll deflect uh, a blame of being a weirdo there. Yeah. Um, but but uh, he has but, a line where he says, "You forget everything he's done for you, dumb boy." Yeah. And it's just it's fantastic. And dumb I really, boy is a great new. I insult. really think we should start throwing dumb boy around more. But 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 the reason I, I bring up um, I bring up this this performance is like. It's a great performance, but it's there's so much acting in this yeah. movie, right? Like, there's nothing subtle about it. Like, when Brendan Fraser shows up, it's like the camera pans over to him, and it's like, that's Brendan Fraser. He's going to have his big moment, and he does, and it's great. But it's just going to rub some people the wrong way. Exactly. Um, the, some people are going to look at that and go, there's so much Oscar bait and this and that. But you know what? At the end of the day, if the writing is good, if the acting is good, cinematography is good, if people are doing their job... It doesn't really bother me. Like, yeah. if the product still delivers, it will work. And it does. Exactly. In terms of, like, my... Uh, the, the thing that contributed strongest to my enjoyment of this movie, um, and then also the flip side of that, is um, the pacing at the end. The last, like, hour of this movie, I, I think we can agree, is the best mm -hmm. part of this movie. Um, in the beginning, you your kind of normal world, Act 1 and Act 2... I think by the end of Act 2, it really starts to get a little slow. And I started to kind of check the watch a little bit, like, all right, is this going to pick up? But once we get once we get the thing that really brings us to the end of the movie, when, like, the, the investigation starts, the real serious federal investigation, all the pieces that were set up start falling into place, and that's when this movie is at its, like, 10 out of 10, if you know the Leo, uh, sorry, the uh, Scorsese meme, absolute cinema, yeah. right? That's That's when we get to that. That's when we get to that uh, to that point, and and that end is very worth it to me. Yeah, I think the strength of that second act, I can see how a lot of people would say it drags. What I think the second act does really well is you care about these people who are being murdered, so they take those time to build those relationships. Mm -hmm. I can one hundred percent see how for many many people that second act would suck because yes, you're not getting much action. The action you are getting is like. A, a, a gunshot execution or someone's house being blown up stuff like that yeah so i can totally see that criticism we were talking about the actors and there's just one more that i want to hit well two more i guess first off we're discussing brendan fraser he's the, de the defending lawyer the prosecutor john lithgow doing the foghorn leghorn accent i think it, i think it's really funny yeah but we got to talk about lily gladstone i think she should win best actress at the academy awards she is phenomenal. She is the one. I'm going to say I think she probably will. Exactly. And that's my I, I, prediction. I it, truly hope so. It's just, it, this is a kind of performance that they really like, yeah. the Academy usually. So. She has such strong subtlety in this movie. Um, there's a little trick that Scorsese uses that he did really well in Goodfellas. When uh, uh, Henry Hill's wife, when they're having the wedding, mm -hmm. normally the movie has been narrated the entire time by Henry Hill. It switches to the perspective of his wife. And it really helps you not only learn about that character, but learn about their partner. Mm. And Scorsese does that wonderfully in this one, where there's a scene where uh, she's going to Washington, D.C. to beg help from the U.S. government. And all these white people are just staring at her as, she get, as she's getting mm. on this train. And it cuts to her perspective. And so we are seeing these wolves staring at her. You know, the, the, a lot of the line used in this movie is, can you spot the wolves in this picture? Yeah. And so we learn that... She believes these people are her like closest friends, mm -hmm. and she is going to beg for help to find out who did it. And the the she is the prey, and the predator are right there. And it just sends a chill down my spine. Her performance is fantastic, even when she's bedridden for a lot of it. She does an incredible job. Speaking of an incredible job, Scorsese, yeah. maybe the greatest living filmmaker. Is that like a crazy take? No, it's not a crazy take. I mean, he is. Uh... 
he, he's the guy. He's 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 Martin. Everyone knows about him. He's one of the few directors with a recognizable face, which uh, which I think says. I mean, granted, like you know, so does Michael Bay, but like, but yeah, I mean, you you know what I mean. That being said, Martin Scorsese's face is actually in this movie at one point. Um, we have very different opinions on uh, what we think about that. Gabe, you gave a take on on as to why. Um, that uh, maybe you want to get into quickly? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, we're running out of time for this review, but I'm going to hit a lightning round real quick because there's a lot that I still need to say about this movie. And yeah. That's, that's okay because it's a huge... There's a lot I could still movie. say too. Exactly. I'm going to say, I think that Martin Scorsese's cameo at the end is him taking admission for the wrongs he has not perpetrated through the movie or movies, but what people think. Um, because a lot of people accuse him for of sensationalizing violence and controversial topics and making movies about them. And that is what the ending is. The ending transports us to like a true crime radio broadcast where nothing matters about the story except for the entertainment value of mm -hmm. it. I think that end is Scorsese cribbing to that confession. And a lot of other movie critics, not that I am a movie critic, but a lot of other people have expressed that view. So I know I'm not alone, uh, but that's my interpretation of it. I thought it was really good. I know some people thought it was just Scorsese is egotistical and he wanted to put himself in his own movie. I don't know what the what the true answer is, but that's my interpretation yeah, of it. My, I mean, qu quickly, because I know we do have to wrap it up. I, I The more I think about it, the more I think that that, that probably had something to do with it. That, that, was, that was probably at least generally what he maybe wanted to get at, what the point he wanted to make. My only problem with it was the way it was done to me was so, and I hate to use this word, I think it's so overused, but it really was immersion breaking. Sure. Like when it was the way they filmed it, the way it was you see the back of his head and then it turns around and it's Martin Scorsese and he's the, the last thing we see before the movie ends and it's this dramatic reveal. It's like once he showed up on camera, there was like an audible groan in the theater. It's so obvious. It's so like, it makes, it's like for a movie that has so much more to say, uh, and there's so much more you can draw from, uh, just about politics, about history, about culture, to like end it on the commentary note about being Scorsese himself, I kind of thought was a little bit distant from the rest of what happened sure. in, in the movie. But I don't, it's not like a massive knock. It's just, I now know what my least favorite cameo of all time is. Sure. <laughs> so my quick lightning round pros, Thelma Schoonmaker's editing is incredible. Yeah. Uh, and this might be the last movie she edits, and I'm excited to see her get the Academy Award. The cinematography is fantastic. There's a shot where DiCaprio gets off a train, and it's very similar to the Copacabana scene in Goodfellas. Yeah. The screenplay is fantastic. And then finally, there are some killer practical effects in this movie. There's one where a woman has been, her house has been blown up, and they peel her head off a door, it's really and gross. it's disgusting. Finally, Jesse Plemons is great in this movie, and this movie is actually pretty funny despite the subject material. <laughs> okay, lightning round out of the way. Roman, Killers of the Flower Moon, not one to ten. What are you giving this movie? Uh, so we don't do half ratings around here. Nope, no half. If anymore. we did, this would be the eight and a half, uh, because I think one half is an eight, the other half is a nine. But I'm gonna be courteous here and give it a nine. I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10 as well. My only issue with the movie are there are some uh, historical inaccuracies in how they depict yeah. the Osage tribe, and that is just a personal gripe. Um, but overall, I thought this movie was fantastic. Uh, I'm excited to see it get the respect it deserves at the Academy Awards, and it's not for everyone, but for those who this movie clicks with, I think they will find a beautiful and heartbreaking, disgusting story of how a group of people was destroyed. Uh, but we live on, and I think that's incredible. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you next time.